so thankful today for Brother Joel being here and leading us in worship, his friend, Sister Shelley, of course, Leah and Tank for being so faithful to lead us. As I drove up in the parking lot this morning, there were tons of kids outside, teenagers and young kids, and they were in the playground area. And as I watched them, they were playing nine squares. That's that big blue thing out there that has all the pegs, and you hit the ball over into the different squares. There were other ones that were running around, and there were some in the gaga ball pit where you try to pelt and run over each other like mad animals. And it got me thinking back to when I was that age, which was, you know, 75 years ago, of what games that we played on the playground. So the ones that I can remember is we would play hide-and-go-seek, we would play tag. We'd play Red Rover. Any kids know that game, Red Rover? So it's where you hold hands with other kids. You say, hey, Red Rover, over, let somebody come over. I was great at that game because I was this same size in third grade. <laughs> so nobody ever called me to come over because I was breaking wrists if I came. But here's one game that I've heard of, but I myself have absolutely never played this game, not one time. And that game is Follow the Leader. So are there any kids here, like kindergarten through fifth grade, who have played Follow the Leader and they're really good at it? If you'll raise your hand, that way I know. How about you come help me for a minute, because I need to know what this is like, okay? So if you are K through fifth and you have played Follow the Leader and you want to come help me, go ahead and come down here. It's okay, don't be shy. This is going to be fun. Okay, so most people have heard of this game, but I don't exactly know what it looks like. So how do we play Follow the Leader? Can you tell me? Yes. Okay, what do you do? Um, so, well, if somebody's doing something and everybody else has to do it, and you're, and you're just going around somewhere and just doing something like dancing. Okay, so one person is the leader. Yes. Everybody else follows. Yes. And whatever that one person does, everybody else has to do. What happens if they don't do it? Nothing? Well, they're out. out. Yeah. So they have to get out of line. And then everybody else keeps going. Yeah. So look, I think we have a pretty good circle right here. And so maybe if we start this way, right, and we go around and then come up this aisle. So we're going to make one really slow loop, okay? And since you were my volunteer, how about you be the leader? Okay. You want to? Okay, so you go to the front of the line. So man in red shirt, everybody see him? He's in the front. Got him? Whatever he does... Y'all have to do. Is that right? That's how you play? So whatever he does, that's what y'all have to do or you're out. We kick you out of church immediately. No. I'm just playing. That's not true. That's, okay? That's not. All right. So I know I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Okay. So walk real slow and whatever he does, that's what y'all got to do. Okay, does everybody understand how follow the leader works now? Okay, y'all can go back to y'all seats. Big round of applause for my helpers. <clears throat> so follow the leader looks like one person's in the front and everybody else keeps their eyes on that one person and whatever that person does, everybody else follows. So this morning we are in the last message of our Give Thanks series. And we're going to look at what we need to do in our lives if we're going to follow the leader. And, of course, our leader is Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of John. We're going to be in chapter 13 today. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17. Three things we need to do to follow the leader and give thanks. John 13, 1 through 17. Number one, we're going to have to favor the look. Almost, without fail, every Sunday, I walk into this sanctuary, 
and I have three things. I have my Bible, I have my notebook, and I have my big jug of water. I come in those doors, I walk down that aisle, and I set my stuff down in the front row. For four years, I've done that every single Sunday. And last Sunday, something very special happened that's never happened before. So as I walk in this door, I get about to the third row, and as I'm walking, my hand and my glass hit the pew at just the most perfect, wonderful angle to where it pops the lid off my glass, knocks the glass out of my hand, and 40 ounces of water, ice, and lemon juice pour all over the carpet. And the best part of this experience was that one of our faithful church members was there to take pictures <laughs> of all this happening so that we could reminisce upon this day. So here's picture number one. There'd be my glass and all that dark area there would be all of the water and the ice and everything else. If you look at this next picture, that's me going, I hear you, Lord. Give thanks in all circumstances. Even as I stand on this towel and soak up this water at 8.45 in the morning, this is not what I want to be doing, but I'm going to give thanks in all circumstances. And this next picture is I'm really trying to praise the Lord. Hallelujah, this is good, Lord. I'm thank you that I have feet that I can stomp on this towel, and I'm thank you that there's more water somewhere in this church, and I'm thank you that it was only water and not coffee or something that would stay in the carpet. So I'm thankful, and then we progress to where now I'm getting down on my knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry for all those bad things that I said when I dropped that water glass and I hope nobody heard me and then we have the full picture here we are all the way down on our hands and knees and we're trying to clean up I had church members coming over to me because they thought that I had fallen and I couldn't get up <laughs> I threw my back out something bad was going on I was going I'm just cleaning up the water <laughs> this is not a position that I favor this is not somewhere where I say listen on Sunday morning at 8.45, there's no place I'd rather be than on my knees over there on the side of the sanctuary cleaning up my whole glass of water that spilled on the ground. I don't favor that look, and yet what Jesus shows us today is that perhaps us being on our knees is a position that we need to favor more in our lives. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Warren Wiersbe gives us this timeline in this picture. He says, on Sunday, Jesus entered into town. On Monday, he cleared the temple, right? He ran out all of the money changers, all those who were selling things. He ran them out of his father's house. He said, this is supposed to be a place of prayer, and you've turned it into a den full of robbers. Tuesday, he had conflict with the Pharisees. Wednesday, most likely, was a day of rest. And then Thursday comes along, and it's the day of the Feast of Passover. And upon the horizon, the very next day, Jesus knew that it was time for him to go to be with the Father. So he was going to have this one last moment with his disciples. And it said he had loved them well throughout his life. And he wanted to love them to the very end. I love the way the NIV says it. Is that he wanted to show them the extent of his love. And so today's family service. So we have all of our kindergarten through fifth graders in here with us. So all of my helpers that came to do the fall of the leader. I want you to think about this question. If you were going to show your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, somebody who's really special to you, maybe your brother or your sister, that you love them, what would you do? And so maybe you would tell them. That's always a good way. Or maybe you could show them by doing something nice for them. If mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle or brother or sister were going to show you how much they loved you, what could they do? They could tell you. They could do something nice for you. They could take you to Disney World. They could buy you an iPhone 11. They can get you an Xbox 360. There's all these things you can say. These are ways that we show love. And so this is the last moment. So in my mind, this is you're on family vacation with 30 of your family members spread out all over the world. You're in one place, and you have one dinner left, and everybody's going their separate ways. You may never all be together ever again. So you want to make this moment special. This is a husband and wife who have one last dinner, and the next day that husband or wife is going to be deployed for nine months. This is the night before your son or your daughter goes off to college. 
you have this one moment. And Jesus says he wanted to show them just how much he loved them. And he could have done anything in the world. He could have cooked them some grilled fish. He could have bought them all a new pair of Crocs. He could have healed any of their pains or their illnesses or their sickness. He could have done anything in the world, and yet instead, he chose to wash their feet. John 13, 2 through 5. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus stands up from the table, he takes off his outer garment, he wraps a towel around himself, he kneels down, he pours water into a basin, and he prepares to wash their feet. So in this day and time, there weren't very many paved roads and everyone will be wearing sandals. And so as you walk from place to place, it might be muddy, it might be dry, your feet would get dirty. And so as you walked into a home, sometimes there would be a place there for you to wash their feet. But very rarely would there be someone there that was going to wash your feet because that was like the most menial, disgusting, gross task in the world. Even a Jewish servant would not wash. It would have to be a Gentile servant. This was the worst of the worst. And so if I were to ask you today, hey, can I wash your feet? That would be a really strange request because we don't do that all the time. These people did. They washed their feet all the time because they were dirty. So I try to think about an example that this would make sense to us. So think about being in a place of honor versus being in a place of lowliness. So we had breakfast this morning at church. It was fantastic. And so if you could imagine being the guest of honor at the breakfast, what would that look like? Maybe you'd be first in line, you'd sit at the head of the table, you'd get seconds before anybody else, you are the top person, you are being honored and respected and loved on. Okay, we understand what that looks like in a meal. And so what if you were to go down the chamber as far as this person is the most highest honored, respected person here, or this is the worst or the least? Then maybe you'll say, okay, well, the person way up here, they get to go in line first. And then I would say the next honored person would be all those who get to go through the line next. And the next would be all the people who are sitting at the table. And then the next might be those who are cooking the food. The next might be those who are cleaning up after the food. The next might be the ones who are picking up trash from the tables. And then the next would be the ones who are putting trash into the trash bags. And then the next would be the ones who are actually taking the trash bags out to the dumpster. So there's a big difference between the one who is top of the line, first there, being honored and loved on, versus the one who's taking the trash out. Does that make sense? What would be worse than taking the trash out? What about the person? who has to clean out the inside of the trash can after there was a hole in the bag and it has nothing but leftover juice and gravy and egg scrapings. That would be terrible. And there's lots of servants in our church that say, listen, I'll gladly do that. But on a scale, if you were to say, okay, listen, this person was first in line and this person is cleaning the bottom of the trash can, which person would you like to be? Very few people would be like, listen, I'm your trash can man. And so we say, well, I want to be at the table. I want to be first in line. Washing feet was even worse than cleaning out the bottom of the trash can. It was the worst possible scenario. Nobody would ever want to do that, and yet Jesus Christ, their Lord, their Savior, their Master, their Teacher, the person that they respected most in the world, is now offering to do this one thing that they would not even let a servant do. Imagine the person that you love the most. Think about the person that you say, I respect them more than anybody else. And they came to you and say, hey, can I come to your house today? Because I'd really like to clean your toilet. No way. I'd like to come over today and I'd like to scrape off the bottom of your shoes with my toothbrush. Would that be okay? No. At my ordination service, my pastor, who is the man who was there the day that I gave my life to Jesus, he baptized me, he married my wife and I, and then he did my ordination service. 
And at the end of it, he comes down and sits me in a chair and takes my shoes off to wash my feet. I said, no way. Because I respect you and I place you up here. There's no way that I would ever let you wash my feet. And so here Jesus is preparing to wash his disciples' feet. And so what might be the lesson for us that we have to favor this look and that so often we live our lives asking the question, how can I be served? How can I be at the front of the line? How can I sit at the best table? How can everyone else bow down to me? And yet here's Jesus, the moment before he's crucified and gives his life, chooses to get on his hands and his knees and wash his disciples' feet so that we might see this example of what it looks like to be a servant to others. So number one, we have to favor the look of a servant. Number two, we have to fail the litmus. So when I was in high school, we would do these things called a litmus test in chemistry class. So you'd have these little things of paper, you'd put them in a liquid, they turn one color, if it was one thing, turn a different color. And we use that phrase often in this life. So a litmus test says, I'm going to tell you the difference if it's A or B, if it's right or wrong, if it's yes or if it's no. This is going to be a test that will tell us the absolute truth. And so here's what happened next as Jesus prepares to wash their feet. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? So this is the image of him saying, here is Jesus who I know to be the son of man. He is my master, he is my teacher, he is my friend. I respect him and I love him more than anybody else in this world. And yet he is bowing down before me to wash my dirty feet. Lord, do you wash my feet? In essence, he's saying, Lord, what in the world are you doing? What in any place, any universe, any idea, any conception would make this to be a good plan? Lord, are you really planning to wash my feet, and Jesus answered him, verse 7. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterwards, you will understand. Typical Jesus answer. He's always saying stuff like that. Lord, we don't understand what this parable means. God, we don't get this teaching that you're saying to us. This doesn't make any sense. We don't understand now, but you will understand later. And Peter's saying, Lord, I don't understand now, and I'm not going to understand later either. There is a 0% chance that I'm going to let you wash my feet. Verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. That means that we will be disconnected. Verse 9, Simon Peter says, Then, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And that's why he said, Not all of you are clean. Jesus loves to paint a picture for his disciples. All throughout the parables that we walk through in the past few months, we've seen a picture that Jesus paints for us. And he says here in the very beginning of our passages that the, Satan had already planted seeds in the heart of Judas and he was going to betray Jesus. And now Jesus is bowing down. He has all of his friends there, including Judas. And he paints this picture about what he is about to do on the cross. So many times we read this story... And this account, we see the image of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, but we don't understand exactly what Jesus is showing us here. So there's two things I think that we have got to understand about these verses. Number one, Jesus is painting us a picture of exactly what's going to happen on the cross. Peter says, listen, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash you, then you have no connection with me. So Peter says, the Lord, wash me up and down. Scrub-a-dub-dub. Every part of me, Lord, because I don't want there ever to be any disconnection. And so if you've never heard this truth before, please let today be the first day that you hear this with ears wide open. When God created man in the very beginning, we lived in a place of absolute perfection where there was no sin. 
And then mankind chose to go his own way. And since that day, we have continually done things that God has not asked us to do. Or we do things that God says we should not do. And we call that sin. And because God is righteous and because God is just, then we have to have an answer for those sins. And he knew that we could never meet the expectation of the law. And we could never be perfect people. So he sent his son to die on a cross. And that was going to happen the very next day. And when Jesus died on that cross, he washed our sins away. And the moment that we choose to have faith in him, and the moment that we give our lives to him, all of our sins are washed away, our sins of past, our sins of present, our sins of future. And once we've been washed, we are clean. But he says, but your feet still need to be washed. And that's a picture of that once you give your life to Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You need to know that. But that doesn't mean you'll never sin again. Because we are a fallen and a broken people. And we're going to keep messing up because we walk this road of life and it's dirty. And so we must continually ask God to forgive us of our sins. So he paints this picture for Peter and says, listen, once you've been washed, you're clean. But all your feet need to be washed. And so we must continue to ask forgiveness. So litmus test number one. Can you be perfect? No. No. So you failed that test. So if you can't be perfect, then you need a Savior. And you need forgiveness. And you'll never be able to follow Jesus until you accept and love Jesus. Listen to these verses about being washed. Titus 3, 3 through 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Lesson number one, litmus test. Can we be perfect? No, so we need a Savior and we need forgiveness. Litmus test number two, will you serve? So even in breakfast this morning, men and women have been serving our church and our staff for weeks and months preparing for this. Today they were cooking food, they were cleaning up. We have many people in our church who absolutely love to serve. There's no question about that. But the problem is, is what happens when we are faced with a scenario where we are called to serve in a way that we don't want to? Jesus is before his disciples. It would not be hard for me to wash my family's feet because I love them. It would not be difficult for me to wash our church's feet because I love you and I want to serve you. But what if I was asked to wash my enemy's feet? Or what if I was asked to wash someone's feet who hurt my wife or hurt my kids or hurt my parents? That would be much more difficult. And so here is Jesus, the Son of God. He kneels down and begins to wash his disciples' feet. And amongst these disciples is Judas. And he knows the next day that Judas is going to betray him. Judas is going to hand him over, and yet still, Jesus served him and washed his feet. Will you be a servant? Yes. Will you serve in ways that other people won't? Of course, Lord, I want to go above and beyond. Will you even serve and love your enemy? I'm out. You lost me on that one, Lord. I just can't do it. Can you serve your enemy on your own? Litmus test. Fail. And so we have to follow Jesus' example. 
And we can only do that by his strength and by his power. Because within ourselves, we'll never be able to serve the way that Jesus did unless he's leading us. So we have to favor the look of being a servant. We have to be able to say, listen, I fell the litmus test, Lord. I am not perfect, and I need a Savior. And I can't serve the way that you serve unless you're leading me, because that's not in my nature. And number three, we need to feel the love. So over the last few weeks, we've asked some of our younger kids what they are thankful for this year. And here's some of their responses. I'm thankful for my mom and dad, and I'm glad they were with me. I'm thankful for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for God giving us food. And today I'm thankful for my family, school, and my privileges. And um, I'm thankful for, for my family and how my family helps me with my struggles. And I'm thankful for my family. For my PE teacher because she's always sending goals for us. I'm thankful for God that He actually uh, made me in the family that I'm in. I love my family and I'm thankful for them, for them too. God, and Jesus, 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 and not being in poverty because um, like God has blessed me with all, all these great things. I thank you for my parents and my family, God, and the church. I'm thankful for my mom and dad. My family and God in heaven. I'm thankful for my family and my friends because they are always around me. Um, cherishing me to do things. I am thankful for my family and friends because they help me out when I'm down. I'm thankful for horses because they're fun to ride. For my family. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ, how he sacrificed himself for our sins so we could live instead of die. So you watch a video like that, and it doesn't matter if one of those kids was yours or if you've ever seen them before. That's what we call a loving feeling, right? That's a feel-good. We say, oh, that's so great to see kids and to hear what they're thankful for. It makes me feel the love inside. And so Jesus says there is this great feeling of love and gratefulness and thankfulness that we will all experience when we learn to serve others. John 13, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? And I can only imagine the disciples who were not always so bright, much like we are not always so bright, going, Yes, Lord, we know exactly what you did. You got down on your knees against our own will because we didn't want you to, and you washed our feet. And he goes, That's right. And do you know why I washed your feet? And they probably go, Because they were dirty. And Jesus goes, Oh, ay, ay, ay. Here's the reason that I washed your feet. Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord. And you're right, for so am I. If I, then your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one whom sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I have done this so that you can have this example before you, that though I am your teacher, I am bowing down and washing your filthy feet, even in between your toes, even with the fish scales and the grime and the crust. I'm going to lower myself, because this is a picture of just how much I love you, that even though I sat in the throne of heaven, I left that place to come down here to die on a cross to show you how much I love you. And if you will serve each other, then you will be blessed. If you do these things, 
you will be blessed. For the entire month of November, we have looked at what it means to give thanks. And in week one, we saw that we need to have more gratitude and less complaining. If you do these things, you will be blessed. Well, how do we have more gratitude and less complaining? We let the peace of Christ rule in our heart. We saw that we need to have more meat and less milk, and so we let the word of Christ dwell in our heart. If you do these things, you will be blessed. We need to have more reflection and less confusion so that in all of our words and all of our deeds, we reflect Jesus to the world. And if you do these things, you will be blessed. The second week, we looked at Paul's words to the Thessalonians where he said, rejoice always, not in your circumstance, but in your Savior. If you do these things, you will be blessed. Pray without ceasing. So we pick up the phone to call God and we do not hang up ever. If you do these things, you will be blessed. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. If we do these things, we will be blessed. Last week we looked at King David's prayer unto the Lord. When he says, God, we have amassed all of this wealth and all of these things so that we can build this temple for you and my son Solomon will complete it. And so, God, we give thanks to you because simply of who you are greater than we are in every way. If we do these things, we will be blessed. Lord, we realize all that we have received, everything physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, comes from you. And if we do these things, we will be blessed. Blessed And God, we understand that the more thanks we pour out to you, the more gratefulness that will fill our hearts. And David showed us this pattern that if we will bless the Lord and if we will bow before him and say, God, everything is yours, and then offer our lives and all that we have to him, then we will celebrate because if you do these things, you will be blessed. Today, he says, that we must favor the look of the servant. Humility is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. We have to fail the litmus and realize that without Jesus, we cannot be forgiven and we can never live selflessly. And we need to feel the love because for those who put others first and serve unconditionally, if we do these things, we will be blessed. Lord, today... This is what we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would be a people filled with thankful hearts. And Lord, that we would see the example of your Son who lowered himself to be a servant. To wash his disciples' feet. The most horrid, tasteless, disgusting task. He bowed down and did with joy because he wanted to show his disciples just how much he loved them. And so, Lord, what would you have us to do to show you how much we love you? Lord, what would you have us to do to show our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our community, our body, how much we love you? Lord, will we begin to favor the look of a servant instead of shying away from it? Lord, maybe there's someone here today who just needs to realize just how much they need a Savior and they need to be forgiven. Lord, when they think about this litmus test, maybe you bring to their mind some way that they have fallen so short and raise their heart full of thankfulness that you continue to show us just how much you love us. Oh Lord, maybe someone walked in this room today and they are broken and they are beat down and they are hurting. They are alone, they are anxious and they are depressed and they just need to feel your love. God, would you knock on their heart's door so loudly that they have to answer it today. God, there's one who came to this place empty. Would you fill them now? If there's one who came in here broken, would you heal them now? God, if there's one who came in here who wanted to give up, Lord, would you give them the strength and the courage to keep fighting today? Lord, help us to see that we have so much 
to be thankful for. And Lord, if we're thankful for what you have done, then we will follow your example. We'll follow the leader. And your word promises us that if we do these things, then we will be blessed. So Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand together with us today. We're going to sing this song of invitation. And this is not my invitation or Joel's invitation to you. This is the Lord asking you to respond to maybe how he has spoken to your heart. And maybe it's the picture of the Savior being on his hands and knees washing his disciples' feet that is showing you today what you need to do next in your life. Maybe it's being reminded of how he went to a cross to wash away your sins. To remind you of just how the extent he went to to show you how much he loved you. Maybe God is showing you something that you need to do in your life to serve others well and follow his example. During this time, maybe you respond by coming to this altar and praying. We'll always have leaders here that would love to pray with you. Or maybe you just open up your heart and just sing and worship and just give thanks to God for all that you have. We just ask that you would hear from God and don't leave this place without responding. Brother Joel, you lead us.